going to talk about comic history with better buddies. Hello, and welcome back to Better Buddies. I'm your host, RJ. With us this week, it's James. Hello. Our Better Buddies icebreaker this week, submitted by a listener, uh, by J, last name withheld, uh, emailed into the show. Here's an icebreaker for you. What is a movie that you think needs to be made? Love, peace, and chicken grease, J. So, what is a movie that you think needs to be made? Jay is my favorite. I was just talking with a with a friend actually, and I was saying like a um, a like South Korean Goodfellas that focuses on uh, like Starcraft would be really funny. Um, and if you played it straight, like just very entertaining. Uh, Did you just say under your breath, Jay is your favorite? Yeah, I said. Okay. Yeah, I said love that guy. It was just very under your breath. Sorry, sorry. I'm like, I'm, I'm uh, a little under the weather today. Uh, um, but yeah, South Korean Goodfellas. I mean, that's a dumb question, but I think it's only fair yeah. to ask it on air. What the fuck is Goodfellas? Because uh, I've heard it referenced before and I've never taken the time to look into it. Oh, that hurts. <laughs> Um, Goodfellas is a Martin Scorsese movie that was made in like 1990 about uh, a young uh, Italian American man, a, a kid who um, has always wanted to be in the mob and eventually finds his way as a young boy to working with the mob and rises through the ranks to become uh, basically one of their top one of their top guys only to fall dramatically from grace uh, shortly okay. after. Um, I thought it RJ, was a mob movie, but I, I, again, it's one of those things that gets referenced just enough that it was on my radar as a thing that existed and I recognized, but not so much that I knew what it was, a la um, Godfather. Very classic, like, guy movie. I would, RJ, if you do anything this weekend, I would highly suggest watching Goodfellas. It is amazing. It is very, very fun. I guess I'm going to do anything this weekend, then. That's disappointing. <laughs> I think I made James mad. Uh, I'm just a little, I'm a little sad, is all. Oh, Don't worry. You're not mad, you're just disappointed? Well, yeah, exactly. We'll straighten this out. Don't worry. We'll have uh -oh. a little talk, you know. James, James is going to take me out back with a sack full of oranges. Yep. It's going to be soap, RJ. It's going to be soap. No, just kidding. It's going to be batteries. It's going to be a whole sack full of batteries. I thought it was you're supposed to use oranges because then it hurts, but the oranges bruise. Therefore, it you can, just causes pain with no in indication that you caused them pain. You can use... Uh, batteries just hurts. You can use oranges or soap is very popular because it, it also does the same thing where it oh. leaves internal bruising, but it doesn't leave any external marks. Interesting. What's a movie you think needs to be made? So the movie I think needs to be made is actually kind of in a similar vein of um, like a gangster thing. I really want to see it's going to be a comic book movie, but it's not what you think. I want to see a movie about the rise of the modern comic book. Uh, specifically like superhero books because comic books changed genres a lot before uh, the 60s. Um, there was, I mean, Archie is probably one of the few survivors, is I think the only survivor of what used to be like, oh, kids in high school just having fun. Like, and the romance books where it was literally just romance. Um, you had the war books that was... Uh, the Marvel version of it would be Nick Fury and the Howling Commandos, but everybody had their Sergeant Fury and Captain Chaos and the the Bravery Brigade for, like, when the war was on. Um, for a time, horror comics were a kick, so every publisher was doing horror comic books. But I think you get a really good uh, back-and-forth, like competition move style movie going on between uh, st uh timely comics aka marvel 
uh, because that's what they were before they became Marvel Comics. And the Distinguished Competition, a.k.a. DC Comics, or Detective Comics. Distinguished Competition. Yeah, anytime Marvel needed to uh, reference their competitor without naming them, they would call them the Distinguished Competition. It's um, an amazing... It's like simultaneously a compliment and an insult. It's real. That's great. Backhanded, but in a good way. But it'd literally be like this movie of like... Because, let's face it, Marvel wasn't first to the superhero scene. DC got there first. They had Superman, they had Batman. And like, yeah, yeah Marvel from... had Captain America and Namor and like... But the war, it really wasn't the same. Batman and Superman are from like the 30s, aren't they? Right? Um... So, Action Comics number one... Um, oh, come on, Wikipedia. Yep, 38, June 38. Wowie, wow. Well, Batman was, uh, 39. And first appeared in Detective Comics number 27. Um, I wonder if any copies survive. Oh, yeah, copies have survived. Not not many, but some have. So, um, we probably know that, like, so... Whereas the Fantastic the Four st- didn't come out, didn't <clears throat> premiere until November of 1961, and Ant-Man... Um, hang on. Ant-Man... Oh, it's not Scott... Uh, I, Hank Pym. Uh, Hank Pym's first appearance was actually in Tales to Astonish number 27, which was in 62. So... Obviously, right, like the Marvel, the timely comic slash Marvel story would focus on probably like the core, like a group um, of, you know, like Stanley and Jack Kirby. Who would Detective Comics like focus on? Who would be the rival team? Well, and like, what would, what are the two, what is the difference? Like, I, because that's what's interesting is like that movie could so truly, worth, in a popular way, it's worth answer. noting the Justice League was first, uh, first appeared in March of 1960. Um, which was a reimagining of the Justice Society of America, which f- was in the 40s, but declining sales pushed it back down. Um, superhero comics actually, now this is news to me just from the little research here, but there was a time period of superhero comics in the 40s, uh, but their popularity, popularity waned in the late 40s. So while... There was, like, superhero comics, like I said, Captain America, Namor, the original Human Torch, Batman, Superman, the Justice Society. After World War II, they really faded away for about ten years. So it'd probably be that um, 1960s, uh, starting probably with 1960, like, the revival of the superhero comic and that competition. uh, Because... The it'd be about the silver age of comic books or so because that's when the uh superhero ones came up. Um, superhero stories again, uh, began the reintroduction of superhero stories began with a new version of DC Comics The Flash in showcase number four in 1956. In response to strong demand, DC began publishing more titles, which prompted Marvel Comics to follow suit beginning with Fantastic Four number one. And the biggest thing being uh, Stan Lee, uh, John Romita Sr., um, Jack Kirby, Steve Ditko. I'm trying to see if I recognize any of these other names. That's about it. Uh, It's worth noting that the best condition known of Amazing Fantasy 15, first appearance of Spider-Man, sold for $1.1 million in 2011, and in 2022, a copy of Fantastic Four number one sold for $1.5 million. Who has them? I don't know. Collectors. People with money. But I I, I picture it... I picture the film as that kind of... like Almost like a newspaper film, right? Like, you get the... um, It'd probably pick a perspective of one of the companies. 
Um, and you got them working, trying to, what's the next big hit? What are we going to do? How are we going to compete? When did you say that's, when did Spider-Man come into first come? Uh, 60, uh, 61, I want to say. It'd be kind of interesting too. It's like a newspaper movie meets, uh, and you can borrow some like Cold War themes from it too. You know what yeah. I mean? Because it's like a uh, sorry, space 62. race. Uh, Amazing Fantasy number fifteen was published on August tenth, nineteen sixty-two. So yeah, it really what would, would you be. Call a, it? Uh, I don't know what I don't know what the fuck I'd call it. Um, <laughs> can we call it Pulp Fiction? <laughs> Damn! Oh, if only. Um, if it was okay, from the perspective of Marvel Comics, I'd probably just call it Marvels. Mm-hmm. Um, from the perspective of DC Comics, um, my running title right now is The American Way, uh, based on Superman saying of truth, justice, and the American Way. Oh, I love that. But yeah, that's yeah, that's I, the movie I I kind of want to see. It, it's more of a historical fiction. I'd watch that in a heartbeat. And let me double check one thing, because I think I know what the turning... Right now, I'm as I'm developing it and talking out loud, I'm almost picturing it kind of like Oppenheimer, of like there's this one historical turning point that is the like crux that the film is building to. Um, But I gotta pull up when... Because there was a, yes, um, so the 19, the 1970s is when the Bronze Age began and the Silver Age ended, um, 1970s is when Jack Kirby left Marvel Comics, uh, so you could use that as a turning point because that's when Kirby went to DC, uh, you could also do it as, ah, yes. Uh, so one of the first comic stories to cover drug use was in 1971. And 1970, um, where was, in 1971, I, I, this is the story I was looking for. 1971, Marvel Comics, Stan Lee, was approached by the U.S. Department of Health, Education, and Welfare to do a comic book story about drug abuse. Lee agreed and wrote a three-part Spider-Man story, Green Goblin Reborn, which portrayed drug use as dangerous and unglamorous. Uh, However, at the time, any portrayal of drug use in comics books was banned outright by the Comics Code Authority, regardless of context. Um, The CCA refused to approve the story, but Lee published it regardless. And with the positive reception, led to a revision of the Comics Code Authority to allow the portrayal of drug addiction as long as it was in a negative light, which soon after, DC Comics had their own drug abuse storyline in Green Lantern, Green Arrow, 85 through 86, where Air- Green Arrow's sidekick Speedy had become addicted to heroin. <laughs> so How the, ironic. <clears throat> the, uh... I think it'd be kind of the ni- mostly the 1960s like build up of oh we're building our worlds and we're getting our characters together and doing all the stories culminates in the fight against the comics code authority of hey we need to tell these stories these are important stories to be told and then he goes rogue and does it anyways yeah first act first act is basically the introduction to I'm thinking like it would focus mainly on Marvel, like because I think there's just more probably as, material there. For as much as like DC stood the test of time, they just weren't as like chaotic as Marvel was. Like, don't get me wrong, I'm a Marvel zombie all the way, I love them, but they also had the most um, publish the the more public drama of like Stan the Man Lee being simultaneously the guy to give writers and inkers and artists credit on the cover of the comic book or in the first page of the comic book, but also the guy taking credit for the creation of Spider-Man and Ant-Man and the X-Men when it was co-created with the artists. 
Like, Steve Ditko and Jack Kirby did a lot to carry those characters. Yeah, and that's a good... Uh... It's good drama. That's natural tension. Um, you know, first act is like setting up the two characters, and it would be interesting too if like Marvel is cast as the more rough and tumble, like Wild West, sort of like rough around the edges, but with a real kind of American charm. Whereas like DC is literally the more distinguished. They are the distinguished competition. Like they they have it's a little more refined. It's a little more wholesome more all American and simultaneously more dark. Like they see themselves as telling like real stories through the medium where like Marvel has argued like, well, you're just kind of making like bubblegum, you know, fiction or in some cases like literal American propaganda. Um, and uh, the contrast between the two of those would be like very fun to watch. Like first act setting up the two studios, second act into the midpoint. Um, uh, the creation of Spider-Man second act, uh, like the back half of the second act is the fallout for the creation of Spider-Man within Marvel. And then maybe something with DC. And then the third act is the, uh, could be like stands sort of, uh, that, that CCA, um, plot line. Yeah. Well, that's one of the things too, that it really loans itself to be, to it being conflict is, so many of Marvel's creations were in direct response to what DC already had. The Fantastic... Marvel wanted to have a super team to compete with Justice League. They didn't have the Avengers yet. It was... They did the Fantastic Four. And Stan, having looked at the Justice League comics, was like, yeah, we're not just doing a super team. They already do a super team. We can't just do a super team. What sets our team apart? They're a family. Uh, They're a family. So, like, Reed and Sue are in a relationship. Johnny is Sue's younger brother. And Ben is... Ben Grimm is Mr. Fantastic's best friend. And they all live together in the building. And, like, they have this family dynamic of kind of the parents and the two rowdy kids. Even though they're all relatively ambiguously similar ages. Yeah, so even going off that, then, like, the Marvel focuses on the sweeter, warmer, kind of more family aspects. Like, they are, like, they are in that way. They're focused on reality. They're the, I would say they're, like, the Disney to DC's Pixar, is, like, what I would say. Mm -hmm. Um, From the little I, I know. It's, in a weird way, it's almost the Pixar to DreamWorks. Of, like, DC is Pixar. And DreamWorks said... Yeah, but what if? Yeah, okay. So kind of popcorn American fun, basically. Like, DC was doing popcorn American fun that's not going to challenge you too much. Whereas Marvel, like DreamWorks, is kind of the, oh, we're coming out of left field. We got to do something different. We got to really hit you. Oh, dude, I think the two are different. I think Pixar is the one that's like the more experimental, like, we're going to, like, at least classic Pixar. Um, I mean, you've heard the yeah. joke of like Pixar is what if blank had feelings, right? Yeah, I know, I know, but it's still like there's still like the cool thing about I've said it before, but like Pixar movies are basically just like they're regular films, but they just have an animated like high concept to them. Okay. Like, you so know, it's, like it's a weird way of like in terms of real world in like company structure, Marvel is more attuned to DreamWorks of. We're coming at it from, you're already in the game doing this, we're trying to catch up, and what can we do to set ourselves apart? Whereas story-wise, Marvel's stories are more akin to the Pixar, like, just telling stories, but it's animated. We're just telling stories, but they're about superheroes. And then what's DC? Well, DC's is the, uh, storytelling is the DreamWorks, right? So, like, let's take a look at A Bug's Life versus Ants. Um, Bugs Life is a story of a ant boat, like they're both stories about ant colonies, but Bugs Life is, hey, I'm an outcast, I need, I'm going through difficult times, I need to find some help to save my colony, and I'm going to go off and out into the real world to see what I can do to find some help, and bring it back. Um, Whereas ants, it's just a, oh, I'm a worker ant who doesn't want to be a worker ant anymore, so I'm going to trade places with this 
military ant to get out of the ant hill and experience the real world. And the hullabaloo that ensues from there because there's a uprising coup being instigated and, like, all of the military ants get killed off. I do forget that, like, ants is kind of, like, a, ants is like a political thriller. Like, yeah. it's kind of like a, like a deep state, like, conspiracy, um, oh, yeah. like, movie, which is fascinating. It's actually about the military industrial complex, so it's very, it's a very complicated movie, actually. Um, so um, you're saying that DC would be ants and, and Marvel would be? Bugs Life? Yes. Uh, so okay, yeah. So, with DC stories, they're telling... It's the difference between telling superhero stories and telling stories about superheroes, right? Superhero story, they have powers, they fight, they punch bad guys, that's the day. Day is saved, that's the end. Whereas stories about superheroes, it's like a story about a superhero, right? So, yes, they're a superhero and they save the day, and then... But that's not all they are. Right? It's the... It's the difference between a movie, a war movie, and a movie about war. In that, like, oh, they... We focus on the battles, and they win the battles. They lose the battles. They win the battles. Yay, they won. Or, hey, he was in war, and now what's the impact on him after the war? Um, That's an excellent distinction, actually. That's really well said. It is interesting to think about where it's, like, kind of two distinct forms of storytelling. Not the only kinds, but the idea where it's, like... You either are totally in something, you play it completely straight, like all the way through, or you have this like kind of other form where you're like half in it and half out. Um, well, and, and both offer different experiences. Going back to like the creation of Marvel's <laughs> first characters, Stan Lee was straight up like, "Yeah, the Fantastic Four have to pay rent." Like one of the within the first like twenty five issues of the Fantastic Four. They're threatened with being kicked out of their building because they couldn't pay rent. Because it's like, oh shit, you don't get paid for being a superhero. <laughs> Whereas, like, the Justice League never worry about the Hall of Justice getting foreclosed, you know? Yeah, they're just kind of like, that's a good, like, are the Justice League ever persecuted? Like, do they ever do? Very Is rarely. there ever a plot line like that? Okay. <clears throat> there are a couple times where the Justice League are like, frowned upon but it's very and again i'm not the most um versed on dc compared to my marvel knowledge but as far as my knowledge goes for the most part the justice league are usually a-okay like no one's really gonna turn the thumb down at you when you've got the big blue boy scout on your side you know yeah, real the the boys and girl scouts of America just with like superpowers. Yeah, like I think maybe I'm trying to think of any times where a Justice League is like at worst individual members of the Justice League will get like hatred and get kicked out. But even then, like there are times where the Justice League will disband, but it's very rarely ever because like the public is afraid of them. Damn. Whereas, like, the Fantastic Four have been foreclosed on, like, three or four times. And cur in the current Fantastic Four run going on, it actually was set up as, hey, we're, like, three months into some disaster that happened in New York that has everybody hating on the Fantastic Four. What happened? And spoiler alert, it's revealed that there was an alien attack, and Reed's solution to it was, well, they're going after the Baxter building... It's something inside the building. I'm just going to teleport the building ahead in time by a year. What did that do? Uh, well, it left a big gaping hole in the middle of New York City where the building used to be and everybody who was around the building used to be. Uh, the idea being that they'll show up perfectly fine. The aliens will have been driven away because whatever they wanted won't be there anymore. But everybody has to wait, like, just a regular year to get back around to when the building shows up again and everybody's loved ones come back. Is that a little? Uh, is that a little Corona uh, metaphor, possibly? No, because the book was published started being published in twenty two, late twenty two, actually maybe early okay. twenty three. In that case, I mean, it could still it, it could definitely be. So it could be, but it's not not really focused wink. on that beyond that, you know. 
It was mostly <laughs> it's mostly a plot device of like, okay, we want to get the Fantastic Four back to their roots of being a family and being explorers. So let's deprive them of some of their toys. Oh, that's fair. I mean, um, that's what we have to do here in America, RJ. We yeah. have to go without some of our toys. We have to get back to being a family again. You don't need food, gasoline, or a house over your head. Get rid of your toys. Those are just toys. They're just toys. They're, they're crutches, really. Yeah, they're real modern luxuries, all right. Well, in a similar way, too, Spider-Man was cre- purposefully created as a teenager because all other teenagers at DC were sidekicks. There were no teenage superheroes. Well, because there's, like, what? There's Robin. Who are the other side? There's Batgirl, so, right? Robin. Uh, Batgirl might have been a thing, but I don't know if she was actually a thing at that point. Um, but Jimmy Olsen was Superman's sidekick. He was a teenager. Boy reporter. Um... <laughs> even with all I don't know the timing on them but even the other like teenage heroes that would pop up would all be considered legacies Green Arrow had Speedy Flash had Kid Flash um there's Aquaman and Aqualad so all the teenagers um basically all the teenagers in until the Teen Titans came along really all the teenagers in DC were legacy heroes that were being mentored by whoever's footsteps they were following are starfire and raven sidekicks no but they came out with teen titans oh so they didn't exist is it the same thing with like like are all so the teen titans like starfire raven uh beast boy cyborg did they exist before the teen titans or um, i know beast no? boy did because he was a part of doom patrol which was actually a comic series with parallels to the x-men <laughs> Yeah, they um they have plot lines in the show about him like getting yep. reconnected with those people. Yeah. That show's awesome. That show's so cool. So compared That's though, cool. Spider Man was a teenage hero. Um <laughs> the I'm trying to think of it. There was um Nova was originally a adult hero and then became a teen hero when he get his with his successor. Um, Speedball. I think it was Speedball. I know it became Penance later, but Speedball was a teen hero. Um, you know what Speedball is, right? Yeah, and, and I know it's the wrong name. I'm getting it wrong. I can't think of what it is. I know Speedball's a drug, but uh, but like Marvel's teen heroes were very frequently just heroes. Like, very much more uncommon for them to be sidekicks to legacy heroes. Like, Bucky was the sidekick. Um, And even the legacy heroes from the modern age, like, Batman has, like, 50 Robins. And Spider-Man has uh, Spider-Man Miles Morales, who just took the name but really wasn't mentored by him. Like, it's not like he's a Spider-Man sidekick. Um, again, Nova was a teenager who kind of inherited the title of Nova f- after the Nova Corps was decimated, but he's still not a sidekick. He's just Nova. Is he from, is he from Guardians of the Galaxy? Is that yeah, he's from? he's from the cosmic side of the Marvel Universe. Um... I'm trying to think of what other teen heroes there are. Oh, the Young Avengers were all, again, legacy characters like Kate Bishop, who became Hawkeye. Um, Isaiah Brad... I think it was Isaiah Bradley. Um, Isaiah maybe... No, Isaiah Bradley was the original character. They changed it for the Hawkeye and the Winter Soldier. Um, but he... Same with Hawkeye and the Winter Soldier. The old black man they go visit that uh, Hawk, er, Falcon goes and visits who got super soldier serum. He ends up giving his uh, grandson a blood transfusion to save his life, which gives him super soldier. Um, Ant-Man's daughter, Cassie becomes a superhero in her own right, but they, the young Avengers are never sidekicks. Like, or I'm surprised they didn't, they haven't brought those people they're working out. On it. Um, yeah, I'm sure. I mean, we've already got, 
Kate Bishop in the Hawkeye uh, <clears throat> Disney Plus series. Ant Man three had Cassie as a with her own powers in it. Um, in Falcon and the Winter Soldier, we see Isaiah Bradley and his grandson there, who's at the gate. Um. Uh, Scarlet Witch and Vision, her two kids, Tommy and um, what's his name? One has magic, the other has uh, speed powers. They're both young Avengers. So it's coming together. But yeah. It's all coming together. Marvel's done it again. Well. They are fun. We'll see. We'll see. People are... People need to just fucking quit having expectations for Marvel at this point. Hard to... Hard to, man. Especially after what they did like four years ago, five years ago, you know? It's hard Uh, to kind of... uh, People... I'm sure for some people, it's hard to approach that with a clear... But it's like, yeah, they did that four years ago, and you've treated every next thing as, are they gonna... Are they gonna do it again? And it's like, all right, calm down, sir. Like, <clears throat> it took over a decade for them to do that. Like, let's, uh, let's not. Oh, what a decade. <laughs> but yeah, that's the that's the movie I think needs to be made. <laughs> I love it. I would watch that movie. I'd help write it. Honestly, I think it'd be well, a great fucking... historical. I mean. It, it's not gonna get it's it's not gonna get made, but mm. I think it'd be a great movie. Never say never. The power of an attractive story is indeed a powerful thing. Well, speaking of all that, our next segment is Better Buddies Recommend, where we recommend a piece of media to enjoy. What do you got? Uh so I watched this movie with my roommates and some friends last night. Um and it's called An American Pickle with Seth Rogen. Oh, you watched um, that? I did, yeah. How was it? I really, really liked it. It's my it's my favorite Seth Rogen movie. Um and I usually I like his stuff for the most part. Like I think he can be a little annoying, especially on Twitter. I hate his life. And I don't mind it. I, I think it's like it's very <laughs> <laughs> like that yeah <laughs> very iconic um but i do agree it can feel a little put on sometimes uh however <laughs> excuse me um basically um the premise of the film is in 1919 new york i should say in 19 19- in 19 there's a poor eastern european orthodox Jew who is living in a shtetl a what? in some backwater country in Eastern Europe. Back a shtetl, it's like a a ghetto, basically. Ah. I think that's what it is. Um and uh he um he meets the love of his, of his life. They move to America, uh they move to New York. He gets a job in a in a pickling factory, and one day while he is around bashing rats, he accidentally falls in to a vat of pickles um and the vat is sealed and quickly afterwards the factory is condemned uh a hundred years go by and he wakes up um and is found perfectly preserved um in 2019 and the film basically follows him reconnecting with um his last surviving relative um and sort of trying to reestablish his family name um it's a great movie about sort of it's one it, there are some moments that are just unbelievably hilarious. Um, Seth Rogen plays the Orthodox, uh, this Orthodox Jew, and it is just incredibly funny. Um, he does such a good job because his demeanor is very serious and traditional and simple. Um, and Rogen sells it, I think, almost completely. Maybe someone who grew up around people who have strong Yiddish uh, accents would be able to say, like, well, Kind of more sounds like an impression. I don't know. I'm not going to say it was authentic, but it 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 worked. It, the voice, like his whole performance, worked. Um, and 
it's just a really wonderful movie about kind of like reconnecting with a distant past reconciliation um really like owning up to the present um learning and incorporating the past and moving forward together into the future um I thought it was a really, really wonderful movie. Actually, um, it should be known it's not directed by him. Oh, really? I can't remember who the name is. I think the the guy who directed his name is Benjamin Cost, Cost or something like that. I I can't remember. Like with a K, I think, but I could be very wrong. Um, and it's based on a short story written by this really great writer named Simon Rich, uh, who actually used to write for SNL in the mid two thousands. And yeah, I would highly recommend it. It's very short. It's only 88 minutes. Um, Hmm. So it goes by, I think, pretty quick. Um, There's some pretty big laughs in it. Uh, Seth Rogen's performance is wonderful. um, And there are some surprises here and there. I remember seeing the ads for it when it came out. And I was like, oh, I think I'd actually like to see that. Because at the time, I was still not like big on seth rogan like i i I was kind of getting into that beginning to hit that point where i was like okay come on seth to be something other than high um yeah but like i saw that come out and i was like oh okay i can he's showing range here i can get behind that it's it's a really pleasant surprise i would say from you're right because he does have a type and he breaks pretty succinctly and in a way he almost kind of comments on his past type um it's really well done it's a really beautiful movie um i really enjoyed it i would highly recommend it um to anyone who's who's interested in seeing rogan in a different light or thing it's a really great just like simple premise simple concept wonderful execution and that's kind of sometimes that's all that's what movies are um and it's beautiful so I recommend that. An American Pickle. Nice. What about you? Well, talk about simple, beautiful execution. I'm recommending Ted Lasso. I have been obsessed with this show since, for the last, like, two weeks. Like, I got an Apple Plus trial for a week so I could watch, just so I could watch the show, because I was like, you know what? I've seen enough, like, clips of it floating around the internet. I think I would like it. It reminded me a lot of, like, Parks and Recreation in terms of being wholesome. And I liked it so much I just paid for a month of Apple Plus so I could keep watching it over and over again. Um, It's so goddamn good. It's just good. But one of the... makes it good. So, A... Well written. It's very well written. People and some of the re- stuff I've been reading online, people are like, "Oh, third season's like the weakest." And it's like, okay, third season may be the weakest, but it's three seasons total, and it's kind of like saying, "Oh, that part wasn't as good, even though it was good. Like the whole thing was good. That was just the weakest part." Um, they didn't. They didn't need almost any time to get like find their footing with season one they had their footing now i think it helps because it was based on a short like commercial from years Mm -hmm. ago where they already kind of had the idea of what ted lasso would be um but the characters are well written and very realistic they don't end up flanderizing themselves as the time goes on because it is only three seasons um The directing and, like, production is very well done. Um, One of those things where a lot of little things will pop back up, either as references later, or the first and last episodes of the series basically mirror themselves, but in reverse, right? So, like, episode one has all these beats that happen, and then in the last episode of the series, it almost does those beats in reverse to close it out. So for anyone, yeah, for anyone who's not familiar, what is Ted Lasso? Uh, like, Ted Lasso. We give a quick premise. Ted Lasso <laughs> is a Warner Brothers created TV show based on, like I said, a commercial. Uh, a American football coach gets hired for a British football club to be the head coach. 
Um, and in the first episode of the series, it's very ob- it's set up very blatantly of like, oh, he was hired on purpose to m- destroy the club. Uh, he doesn't mm-hmm. know it. Nobody else knows it except the owner of the club. Uh, sh- but she hired him knowing as an American football coach, there's no way he could do a good job at coaching soccer. Right? Like, it's Ameri- it's British football. It's a very passionate sport. It's important and big money there. Like, he w- there's no way he'd be able to keep up and actually be able to coach the game well compared to people who have spent their lives around the sport. Um, but as the series goes on, Ted Lasso's positivity and uh, focus on honest emotional connections uh, wins people over and helps the growth of the players and everyone around him. Um, Ted Lasso is kind of the coaching ideal in his coaching philosophy of he's there to make the, he's there to help all of the athletes be the best versions of themselves on and off the field. Um, all that being said, Ted himself is not without his darker moments and storylines, which the show does a good job of touching on and making them feel real and authentic. The struggles a person who comes across this positive would have with some of the life events that have happened either in his past or as the series goes on. The, the series also does a really good job. Uh, I just want to touch real quick. There's a lot of like, there is a number of mm-hmm. romance subplotting of the series does a good job of not making it be a Shakespearean ma- pair everybody up by the end. Um, it's yeah. very natural. He does sound like that does sound like a very less than nope uh, character. It is a very um, endearing, I think, portrayal of an American attitude where it's like, because I know that in a lot of our media or a lot of media in the world, it's like Americans can be stereotyped as like very like brash and dumb and like destructive and kind of like only successful because they've been successful before, not because they possess any actual like refined qualities that lead to success. Um but from what I've heard about this show, like, it does sound like there's a genuine, like, I'm not saying, like, oh, no other culture has that optimism. But I do think there is something to be said for, like, you know, the American mentality of, like, oh, if I just kind of think positive about it and work real hard, like, oh, I can do anything. It's, well, he's it's also, very innocent. He's also the Midwest nice. Okay. Like, he is Midwest nice personified. Okay, I love that. So, tons of dad jokes and dumb jokes and puns. Uh, one of the fun jokes that the show kind of does throughout the entire series is they'll name, thi- like, they'll do the, um, name a couple things or list a couple th- synonyms for things and then have you figure it out. One in particular that stuck with me is, uh, Ted says that one of the players is a wigwam inside a TP, and... <laughs> a new character that kind of just got introduced, like looks around a little confused and his, uh, assistant coach, coach beard, uh, says he's too tense. <laughs> That's cute. I yeah. Like that. So lots of like wordplay jokes like that. Um, and the show manages to have a mustache twirling villain without it being like overdone. Um, because the owner of, it's focused on the Richmond AFC football club, um, AFC Richmond and the owner, Rebecca Wellington is the recently divorced, uh, woman who her husband was the owner of the club, but in the divorce, she got the club. Okay. Uh, so her ex-husband pops up throughout the series kind of as this recurring villain who, He's not ever inherently doing anything outright, like, evil to ruin their lives. It's more just him as a bad guy being a gloaty, braggy, I know I can mess with you kind of person. And they all just keep, like, the one of the points of the series is them learning not to let him get under their skin. A nice message, honestly. I've heard a lot of people like this show because they say that it it does feel very nice and like warm. Um, 
in a good way. I've heard some of the the accusations are that it's a little too saccharine, it's a little too sappy. Oh. Um, but I don't know. There's a lot of shows nowadays that are like very cynical and sort of like it's dreary. Very... There's enough shows these days that are cynical and dreary, right? We don't need more of it. I yeah. can definitely see people saying it's saccharine and a little too sweet, but I would also say that's the point of it, right? It's it's about personal growth. It's about becoming better as people. I don't... There, at least every other episode, there's a point where it drives me to tears because I'm just like, oh my god, that's so true. Um, and it doesn't help that Ted has a relationship with his son that I'm a sucker for any father-son relationship in media, so... Um, but it's... It's never unearned. Like, the, the sappy, sugary, sweet moments of the show are never just, like, one after... It's never one after another of, like, da-dun, da-dun, da-dun. Here, this is... We have to do the best we can together. Oh, we're gonna do the best we can together. Oh, we're all together. Like, it's it's a lot more earned. And there's definitely points where um, it almost counters it. Like, there are points in the show where characters will just kind of come out and be like, yeah, no, y'all got in too deep on this idea. Like, it's, you're putting too much stock in it. Um, or the negative, like, the neg- there are negative parts of the show, right? Um, one of the big, and this is a pretty, again, this is maybe a spoiler, but it's season one and it's like episode one or two, maybe episode three. Um, it's very, very quickly revealed that one of the reasons Ted took the job is because he's having issues at home with his wife and she needed some space. That's kind of a somber, like, beginning to such a a cheery... So, like, for as much as Ted himself is a very, like, externally upbeat person, it's... He's not an eternally upbeat person, right? Like, Leslie Nope is sunshine incarnate, but from what I remember, the worst that happens for Leslie is she gets writer's... Like, functionally gets writer's block in season four. Early in season three. Late season three, early season four, she gets writer's block. And she has to deal with the crushing weight of politics but she never yeah. has like a oh god like what are we gonna like she, she doesn't deal with problems quite as serious as that you know like leslie nope doesn't end up in therapy and ted lasso does at one point yes i'll check this out i'm in the middle of watching another show for the first time right now but maybe i can slot this one in oh and that's one of the nice things too about the show is it do, it does take a couple topics that need to be talked about more such as mental health in sports yeah that's a nice touch um so yeah ted lasso uh, it's been a while since i've gotten a show that's hooked me like this right like because i'm one of those people that i'll get interested in a show and i'll watch it on a loop right of just like oh i love this it's been a couple years since i've had a show really hook me this hard what was the last one parks and rec no um i think the last let's see what the last one be um time wise i think mystery science theater 3000 would have been the most recent show to really hook me as like a, oh God, I got to just watch this over and over again. Um, before that, it would be, um, make sure I don't mix these up. Before that, it would have been, I guess before that, it would have been Monty Python's Flying Circus. And then Lucifer, oh wait, where was, nope, nope, I got to go back a bit. Uh, Castlevania, then Monty Python's Flying Circus, then Lucifer. Parks and Recreation was high school when I got super stuck into that. Damn. Like, late high school, early yes, college. Same. Like, same, same. I think this show is 
hitting that same button. How many seasons? Three. Ten to twelve episodes each. I heard, I heard people were uh, were up in arms about the fact that he didn't win at the Golden Globes. I hey. thought it was a snub. You know, it shows better than that. Sounds like the Ted Lasso spirit to me. No, it really is though, because the show's yeah, the show is all about work towards healthy mentalities, and it's it actually becomes a little bit of a problem in the show. Ted's like, yeah, I don't care about wins or losses, mm-hmm. and at one point, his assistant coach, Coach Beard, has to like yells at him, and is like, I don't, I I know you don't care, but it we can't lose. Like there are consequences for losing here. It's not. It's not high school sports. It's not college sports. There are consequences for loss. It's honestly a pretty good lesson for a show to have. And to portray it, like, realistically is difficult. Yeah, and I think... I'll have to give it a try. One of the things I just thought of, too, is that, like, especially growing up the way we did, where it's like, "You, you participated! You did the thing! Congratulations! Like, it, do- it doesn't matter if you win or lose. What matters is you had fun. And then to emphasize that for a while in the show of like, yeah, it's important that they just, that they're there to develop and grow. And then to also have that moment once you've got settled in of like, hey, this is professional sports. Here are the consequences that occur if they aren't winning. So, yes, it's important to grow as a person and have fun and not let the losses get to you but also sometimes you need to just fucking win yeah good establishment of stakes very much so so yeah Ted Lasso alright our next segment how to be a better buddy where we give some real and some humorous advice our first question this week. This is a very, very uh, old question now, but I think we should answer it to get it out of the way. Why does Christmas music sound best when it's old timey? With further details, it may be just me, but I hate modern Xmas songs. For me, Christmas sounds like Christmas when the music is from 1970s and backwards. Anybody else feel this way? Old timey Xmas music just hit different. I mean,. I actually, I. It's a good question. Um, Does anybody write Christmas music these days? Yeah, people come out with Christmas music still. I think the thing is, is like a good Christmas song, like requires a level of belief and like investment in the source material. Like, it's a very hard genre because it's like a already very established. Like we all know what it is and everyone's basically, you know, the same like 18, 20, 30 songs play on repeat, like every holiday season. And it's very difficult to like make a new song that sounds both like modern and yet still calls back to some of the older themes that are talked about in like Christmas songs of like, you know, the 40s, 50s, 60s, and some of the 70s, like the, you know, family and, and fresh snow. These are very, like, common kind of, like, themes. Uh, and I, I do think that, like, there are some successful ones. There's, like, uh, I think Mariah Carey's uh, All I Want for Christmas is, like, the most yeah. recent modern example. It's, like, constantly installed with the rest of the older Christmas music because it's, like, it's like she actually sounds sincere in it. She she's not doing it self-consciously. Yeah, like it's not she's ironic. singing it like no, and and she's singing it very genuinely. And like a big theme of Christmas music is often singing about you know not being able to wait until you see loved ones or you know uh, uh, really, really, really wanting something. But that something is a, it changes. It's a little bit different than when you first wanted it when you finally find it. You know and uh, that's maybe a somewhat like pretentious analysis, but I do think her song kind of conveys that feeling while still having a modern tone to it. So I think there's just like an associated warmth with that older media because of the way that they 
saying and the style well, of the music, but I also think it has to do with like their intention. Part of it too is Christmas is a time for family, right? So compared mm-hmm. to other points in your life where you're choosing the music, what's likely happening is you're like, you grow up every year, your parents put on the Christmas music or your grandparents put on the Christmas music and they're putting on the music of they're used to hearing. So especially with people about our age, our parents are putting on the music they heard as kids that they grew up with that to them is Christmas music because that's what their parents put on, which is why all this music from the 50s, 60s, 70s is Christmas because for the last like three, four generations, oh, excuse me, for the last three and four generations, that's what the Christmas music has been. So in turn... Fun. As you have kids, you're going to put on the Christmas music that you think is Christmas music, which is what your parents showed you, which is what your grandparents put on for them. And now your kids are also going to say, yeah, 1950s, 60s, and 70s is what Christmas music is. Yeah, and it's a very, you know, um, I will say, like, for instance, in the 80s, like, Last Christmas is a great song. Uh, the Trans-Siberian Orchestra, um, you know, Midnight in Sarajevo, which, and, like, their Trans-Siberian albums. Trans-Siberian Orchestra like, um, is, like, a 90s and upward. Yeah, and and like they they have like some very popular songs that are sort of like eking their way into the uh, those eras have songs that are eking their way into the charts like into the repertoire. But I agree as well. I think like it's mainly as well just like um you know Christmas was obviously celebrated in this country for quite some time, but I the show I've been watching is Mad Men and in that show it's obviously a slight exaggeration, but everyone, like every scene, every shot is like drinking or smoking, like everyone yep. all the time. Um, I, I can't emphasize enough, like how basically every new scene, someone pulls out a cigarette and starts smoking. And like, um, you have to think that after the the second world war like our country especially just kind of like for good and for bad we just kind of took a break like we just like chilled out for i mean we didn't really chill out but like that must have been such a unique sensation of relief and pride and like a kind of uh warmth and like security yeah it was a very like job well done everyone like now let's like let's celebrate for 20 years, you know? And like, I do think that old Christmas music carries that spirit of the time where it's like, like Christmas is like, it, it's obviously a, a Catholic holiday. It's a tradition, but it's like, um, you know, like it's a Catholic it's, it's, holiday, but it's such a commercialized public holiday that like, I, yes, there are religious connotations, but I've always kind of been skeptical of the, like, oh, Christmas is bad because it's religiously, like, focused. It's like, okay, yeah, but Santa Claus ain't Catholic. Like, it... Well, like, The big fat I mean, man in the red suit with the reindeer living at the North Pole has nothing to do with little baby Jesus. Yeah, I mean, he comes from the St. Nicholas stuff, but you're right. Like, he's an incorporation of St. Nicholas, but he's also Odin. Is he really? Is that yeah, where Santa they Claus draw? is an incorporation of Odin from Norse mythology, uh, and um, Saint Nicholas from the Catholic saints, and Coca Cola. Some good old American advertising. Yeah, Santa wasn't yeah, red until Coca Cola made him. And I, I just think like, um, I, I think like it is an American sort of symbol. Like it's a lot of countries celebrate it, but it is very like our country sort of spearheaded the popularization it to like this like larger um extent and i think like it became very quickly like a symbol of like that this country was doing something meaningful and that we were kind of like important and that we felt you know it was opt it was optimism and i think that's the thing about a lot of those old christmas songs is they're very they all sound optimistic you know they're all just happy to be around and in the snow and seeing family and um and it's a great like american project it's like who the fuck wants in... to listen to a christmas song about sex and drugs yeah no one no one like 
No one wants to listen to that. No one wants to listen to a Christmas song about, uh, actually, wait, I take that back. I gotta take that all back, uh, because the, uh, uh there's one s- Christmas song. It's pretty, it's relatively popular, um, but it's about, uh, New York. It is Fairy Tale of New York. Which if oh, I recall, that's the Pogues. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. Yeah, that's um, which is to be expected from them. The first lyrics are it was Christmas Eve, babe, in the drunk tank. <laughs> so I gotta take back what I said about sex and drugs on Christmas. No, I do. I do. it's a very pure time. It's like a time for people to come together. It does feel like genuinely unique. Um and I know it's hard because obviously like there are people of different faiths who don't celebrate it or, you know, they feel excluded from it. I'd like to think that it has become something more meaningful where it's just a way for people to come together once a year and sort of just be happy together, yeah. you know? Um, well, it's like, one of the things, I know one criticism I've heard, which it's valid, but it's from a somebody in the movie TV industry. Uh, he's Jewish and he was like, yeah, I, Growing up, there was all the Christmas specials on TV, right? And every uh, every sitcom had its Christmas episode. There was never uh, um, what am I what, what am I looking for, James? Inclusion, a Hanukkah special. Hanukkah special, right? There's no Hanukkah specials. Yeah. Like, and it's like, yeah, I get where you're coming from. Like, growing up Jewish, you're inundated in Christian ideology symbolism imagery holidays like i I get that especially like you know easter it's even much more so than christmas i'd argue easter is a religious holiday yeah that is way more religious but also let's look at the stop motion christmas specials we've got santa claus is coming to town rudolph the red-nosed reindeer frosty the snowman uh, and then the little drummer boy, like of the four I just listed off, and there are other ones I can't think of them off the top of my head, but only the little drummer boy has anything to do with Jesus. Yeah, well said. Um, animated specials. You got the Grinch stole Christmas. You got Charlie Brown Christmas, which is does reference the Bible, but more so in Charlie Brown asking what's Christmas all about. And yeah. Linus offers that as a solution. Uh, but if you know anything about the Peanuts, it very frequently incorporated scripture kind of as a joke. Not joking, not dunking on the Bible, but the fact that these children would be quoting scripture like studied theologians. Um... And then you've got plenty of plenty of TV shows, cartoons, all have their Christmas specials, but they're never about the kid. A Christmas Carol's not even about Jesus. Yeah, you can make the case that there are themes of like sacrifice and giving of yourself and a transformation, like almost but all that's Christmas. More, those themes are all more related to Easter if you're looking religiously. I kind of like, kind of, I mean, usually it's like, there's an, in, there, you know, like in a, in, if you watch any production of a Christmas Carol, chances are you're going to be, you're going to hear some Victorian carols, which were almost exclusively, um, Christian yes. in their, in their underpinning and in their tone. So like these things do exist. Um, but like you are right where it's like, I think a, a great Christmas movie is Scrooged. If you've have you seen it or no, uh, I know enough. That's that's a great it's a great what I would say secular retelling of you know um of a Christmas carol where it's just very sort of like plain and focusing on one man's transformation from someone being selfish to being open and giving to other people. Um and while these are like usually stated to be Christian themes, I think the idea uh, whether it's Christians doing it or anyone else, the idea of like uh uh, segregating 
like the themes of like charity or self discovery, transformation, you know, realization, kindness, like hope, the idea of like, you know, segregating those to just Christian themes and ideas is like incredibly myopic and they don't just belong to that system. They belong to everybody. Like I, yeah. I think everyone can in some way live those. Absolutely. So yeah, uh, modern, a lot, too much of the modern sentimentality is that sentimentality is bullshit. So yeah, I'm just we, tired we, of we them borrow not the sentimentality the of our ancestors. You know, I'm just, I'm just tired of them not emphasizing the Christ in Christmas. I'm really going to do something about this. I'm going to boycott Starbucks. I'm going to do I'm going to get real angry in a Starbucks. We get angry. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to do something. I don't know if it was a joke tweet or a serious one, but I swear I saw some like screenshot floating around the internet one time uh, where somebody was all upset that, oh, Starbucks is supporting smoking weed because they put bulls on the cups. And I was like, dude, but you don't. It's just these white half circles. It's It's nothing. That's nothing. Yeah, RJ, you're a big weed head. You're a big, you're a big smoker. You token up every day. 420 blazed. <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. Hey, I'm not going to lie. I'm kind of dying here. Um, well, do you mind if we... we uh, that's good. I'm at my end. I'm, I'm wilting. Well, thank you for joining. appreciate your power. Yeah. Here. Thank you for having me. It's always it's always fun. It's always refreshing to come on here. Thank you to the band Problem of Interest for letting us use the song Living in the Moment off the album Cross Off yesterday. You can find them on iTunes and Spotify. You can find us on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever fine podcasts are sold. We're also on social media. Our Facebook is Better Buddies. Our Twitter is, or former Twitter, is at Better Budcast. Use the hashtag Better Buddies when you tweet about the show. And our Gmail account is betterbuddiescast at gmail.com. You can send us fan art, hate art, fan mail, hate mail, declarations of love and or war, icebergies you want us to answer, such as the one Jay sent in today, or questions you need advice on. And please remember to share the show on social media. Last but not least, be a better buddy. It's, uh, I think most people are focused on Seabird Hawking. Yeah, that was an odd one to me. Yeah, I mean, he did cheat on his wife. You knew about that. But also, how did he cheat on his wife? I don't think him controlling a robot counts as anything. I mean, his brain is so smart, RJ. It's like, it's not even fair. Talk about a mindfuck. Ah, uh, nice. <laughs>